There it is. It's ready to go. As soon as it gets sunny, we're going to put some, I think, blueberries on there that we had frozen to dry. It's pretty, isn't it? Okay, here we are back in my office, ready to answer some questions. Now, we really stirred up the hornet's nest with that discussion on fake tongues and got lots of questions and a lot of challenges. And I'm going to read you just a few of them, and then I'm going to answer them. Now, this is going to take a little longer than usual because I am going to go through all the Scripture on it today. In fact, when I say all the Scripture, I'm going to go through some Scripture that some of you tongue, fake tongue wagglers... Uh, are not going to appreciate, but we're going to look at it anyhow. All right, here's what someone said. Here I will have to disagree with you. I speak in tongues, and it sounds fluid after spending a lot of time praying in it. I went from saying two words to full sentences like a baby to a toddler. Whenever I get night terrors, I pray in tongues, and the demons scatter. Of course, there are false tongues, demonic ones, etc., I won't throw the baby out with the bathwater. You're still a good teacher. <laughs> I, I appreciate that, that you think I'm still a good teacher after disagreeing with you on that one point. But actually, you made my point here real well. I have never said that tongues is are demons causing it, that's the devil doing it. Now, the devil can do that. He can He can duplicate anything, and he does. And I'm sure there are many cases. In fact, the... 5,000 times around the world where people in false lang false cults uh, are uh, uh, demonic religions, are uh, primitive uh, religions with soothsayers and necromancers and what all. Yes, they speak in uh, tongues, and uh, it's the devil doing it in many cases there. And so I know that does happen, but I've never said that. All I have said was that there's a true gift of tongues, and then there's a fake gift of tongues. And 99 plus percent of the tongues in America are fake tongues. Now, I would love to see you exercise the true biblical gift of tongues. That'd be a wonderful thing. I've heard two or three cases of that, never seen it in my life, but it were reliable cases. For instance, Mark Zook, a missionary, by no means charismatic type, uh, in uh, New Britain, an island north of Papua New Guinea, went there and won a tribe to Christ. And I heard him say afterwards, as we were sitting around talking, and he said, you know, he said, my tribe, once they came to know the Lord, they all took off to another tribe they'd been at war with, a tribe whose language they did not speak. And they stayed about six weeks. And when they came back, they said they trusted Christ. He said, well, how did you communicate with them? And they said they didn't know. They just they just talked and they understood. So he said, I think they were speaking in the gift of languages like they did in the book of Acts. And I wouldn't doubt that at all. And that would be a modern day proper use and expression and gift of tongues. And uh, another one in a situation where there was someone in a foreign language that understood and received the gospel from someone else. And so uh, there's two or three others I've heard that I can't remember. Now, here's what someone else said. God's language does not have to follow man's rules. <laughs> God has never been without being consistent, scientific, and following rules. And uh, if it is a language, any kind of a language, anywhere in the universe that God or angels or anyone speaks, it's going to follow grammatical rules. It'd be like saying math doesn't follow rules. Language is is a it has to be logical. What would be the proper use of tongues look like in the church today? The proper use of tongues tongues in the church today would be, say, in Nashville, not too far, about an hour and a half where I am. There's some Laotian churches and uh, many multiple language churches. Now, if I were to go down there, and most of the people there speaking just Laotian cannot understand English, and they asked me to give a testimony, and I stood up, and God allowed me to speak in the Laotian language, which I've never learned, I guarantee you it wouldn't be baby words. It wouldn't be da ba, you know. It would be 
it would immediately be the gift of fluent, accurate speech in that language. That's the way they would hear it. That's the way it would come across if it was a gift from God. It's only when you're making up your own, and that's not even hypnotism. That's not the devil. That's, that's silliness. When you utter a few words and keep doing that until you refine the process and create your own language, that's, which is a non-language. That's, <laughs> that's not what it, So the true gift would be if I were able to communicate with them in that language. Now I'll give you another example. If someone in the church were to stand up and speak in Laotian and there was no one there present uh, who spoke Laotian, uh, and uh, the pastor or preachers then say, okay, uh, who, who, who here understands that language he just spoke? And no one raised their hand. He said, no one here understands it. Like, no. He said, then you need to keep silent in the church. It's improper for you to speak if no one here understands that language. And uh, then some, God might give someone the gift of hearing Laotian. And they would stand up and say, I don't speak Laotian, but I, I understand what he's saying. It's coming through loud and clear, and here's what he said. And the, God, the pastor said, okay, we received that. That's a, that's a message in Laotian. I don't understand why. Uh, God would speak to us in Laotian today, but he has. And here's what he said, and we're thankful for that. That would be a proper use of the gift of tongues. I've been around tongues all my, uh, for 60 years and uh, heard it and been around it and have, <laughs> have a lot of good friends that speak in tongues. And there's a lot of godly people. I would not say people are not godly because they do. I would just say they're a bit silly and a bit messed up uh, in one area and certainly biblically off. Okay, let's look further. What about this verse, though? For though he speak in the tongues, he does not speak to men, but to God, for no one understands him. However, in the spirit, he speaks mysteries. What does that mean? We're going to cover that in 1 Corinthians 14, 2. Then another says the gift of tongues in your prayer language, the utterance in mis mysteries to build up your spirit. There's nothing in the Bible that says tongues is the purpose of it is to build up your spirit are two separate things. So what people have done, these uh, fake tongues crowd, is they've seen that what they're doing cannot be justified by, by, by the scriptures. So they've created a separate category so they remove it from the ability to be examined in, biblically or scientifically. Such arrogance, thinking you know everything. Well, I don't know everything, but there's some things that are so simple it's easy to know, and one of these is the stupidity of fake tongues. You actually think God speaks English or German or Hebrew. Yes, he does. When a person in Hebrew prays, God's got the gift of hearing Hebrew. God speaks his own language. Uh, yeah. Uh, when he talks to who? It's not any language spoken on earth. Well, I don't know where you got that because the word tongues in the Bible is the word language. In fact, every time it's used, it's got parentheses, italics, meaning that it was not part of the original text. Uh, excuse me, the unknown. The unknown is not part of the original text. And so when it says tongues, it's speaking of language an unknown language, unknown to the individual. There is no exotic, heavenly language not following rules that God speaks. It's not any language spoken on earth. The tongues are the Holy Spirit speaking to Jesus. Well, that's just not the case. The Holy Spirit has given at Pentecost to glorify God and to edify the church. That's totally false. The Bible tells us why it was given, and that was not the purpose. If one were in court of law to prove one had the gift of the Holy Spirit, then tongues is the sign. For by no other sign does one have the proof of the gift of the Holy Spirit. Well, then that case is a whole lot of sodomites who think Jesus is a fake and a fraud, who speak in tongues, and then would have proof they've got the Holy Spirit. I've gone to prisons about 3,000 hours. And on Sundays when I have gone in, they have church services. Of course, everybody comes. And the guy playing the piano, the tongue speaker, and leading the praise worship is a queer that all the 
big guys have done over and over again, and he loves it, and he speaks in tongues. Does that prove he's got the Holy Spirit? I had a really difficult time singing with that queer playing the organ, but that's what you do when you go to prison and to put up with. Acts 10.46 and 19.6, we're going to cover that. There's no indication the languages were understood or identified. That, uh, that's wrong. Paul's writing implied that the spirit-inspired language may not always be human, hmm? but may be spiritual. Spiritual language, what could a spiritual language? Either language or not. Heavenly or angelic. 1 Corinthians 13.1, we'll cover that as a means of communication between the believer and God. Praise God. No, no, no. Acts 2.38. We'll look at that. God uses the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. So he's admitting that the, what's going on is foolish. And uh, that God, therefore, he says, is, it must be of God because it's foolish. You cannot compare human linguistics with spiritual language. Do you know what the tongues of angels sounds like? Yes, some of these preachers are absolutely fake, but calling tongues that you cannot discern gibberish is insulting God's gift to us. It's gibberish, okay? What I hear on the radio and on the TV evangelist and when I've gone to Pentecostal churches to preach, what I hear is gibberish. It's not a language. I'd love to hear a real language. 1 Corinthians 14, 20. Let's look at the scriptures. Brethren, be not children in understanding. Howbeit in malice be ye children, but understanding be men. In the law it is written with men of other tongues and other lips, I speak unto this people. And yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. This is Paul writing to the church at Corinth about the tongues use. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. But prophesying serveth not for them which believe not, but for them which believe. Now, let's go back to Isaiah and find the original passage where he says, With men of other tongues will I speak unto this people, and see what the Bible has to say about it. This is where it all began, Isaiah 28, 9. Whom shall we teach knowledge, and whom shall we make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breast. So as soon as they are weaned, they're ready for this teaching. For precept must be upon precept, precept on precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, there a little. For with stammering lips and another tongue will I speak to this people. This is the passage he's quoting concerning the tongues that they were speaking in the New Testament. For with stammering lips, and the word stammering means to deride, that to rebuke, to call into question. And another tongue will I speak to this people. So notice, this is not an unknown language. This is a language that they don't know, the people that are hearing it, but they're understanding it because they're being rebuked. That to whom he said, this is the rest. This is what he said to them in this other language. This is the rest wherein ye may cause the weary to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they would not hear. So in the book of Acts, God offered to the nation of Israel this refreshing from the Spirit. Peter introduced it on the day of Pentecost, and people in multiple languages said it, and the people heard that passage quoted in multiple languages. But the word of the Lord was unto them precept upon precept. So this other language was precept upon precept, line upon line, here a little and there a little, that they might go and fall backward and be broken and snared and taken. He said they were being taught line upon line, precept upon precept with this other language, with this tongues. They heard it. It was there to rebuke the nation of Israel, resulting in their fall, which he talks about there in the book of Romans. So that's how it started. That's how it came about. Now, somebody said, I received the baptism of the Spirit and fire. No, you have not. No one living right now has received the baptism of fire. Listen, look at what the Scripture says. I indeed baptize you with water unto repentance, but he that come after me is mightier than I, whose shoes I'm not worthy to loose. He shall baptize you with the Holy Ghost and with fire. Now, what is this baptism of? with fire. Uh, people try to equate the tongues of fire with this passage. That's not true. 
If it is, when did you see someone receive the gift of tongues with a fire, a cloven tongue of fire, visibly falling on their head? You never have. Then you didn't receive the baptism of fire according to your own definition. But here's what the baptism of fire is. Be baptized with the Holy Ghost and with fire whose fan is in his hand. You fan of fire. And he will thoroughly purge his floor and gather his wheat into the garner, but he'll burn up the chaff with unquenchable fire. So when Jesus came and the Holy Spirit came after him, he said this Holy Spirit would come and he'd baptize with the Holy Ghost and for those who didn't repent, he'd baptize with fire. They'd be merged into the fires of hell. So no one receives the baptism of fire except people who die and go to hell. So if you're going to be scriptural about that, you're going to have to drop that terminology altogether about receiving the baptism of fire because you're claiming that you've gone to hell. <laughs> I wouldn't want to make that claim. All right. Here's another passage. Acts 10, 45, 46. And they of the circumcision which believed were astonished as many as came with Peter, because that on the Gentiles also was poured out the gift of the Holy Ghost. This is the passage that we read a while ago that they said they didn't understand, that there was an unknown, un unintelligible utterings that took place. For they that heard them speak with tongues and magnify God. So it said they understood that to be a magnifying of God. It was not the act of standing there jabbering into the air with unintelligible syllables that glorified God. That wouldn't glorify God. If it did, then the Mormons are glorifying God. The Buddhists are glorifying God. Uh, all the cultish religions down in Haiti that jabber in tongues and deny Jesus Christ, they'd be glorifying God. No, they understood what was being said. And, and here's the other passage that I was challenged on. And when Peter had laid his hands upon them, the Holy Ghost came on them, and they spake with tongues and prophesied. They said there's no indication that, that was an, a language, an earthly understood language. Well, whatever it was, they interpreted it and understood it as a prophecy and received a message through the language. So to say that that was unidentifiable utterances would be contrary to the text. Now, let's go back to Acts chapter 2. I know this is long, but you wanted some answers on this subject, and so let's see what the Bible says. And when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all one accord in one place, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a mighty, rushing, mighty wind that filled the house where they were sitting. Do you know of anyone that where a church has had a mighty, rushing wind when somebody received the Holy Ghost? And there appeared unto them clothing tongues like as of fire. No, no, I've never seen or never heard of that. And he, and he sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues. Again, the word languages only appears in the Bible one time. But throughout, if you look up tongues, it's dozens, dozens of times throughout the whole Bible. It always refers to another language. It was a way of saying another language or another lips, it says in some cases was another language. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other languages as the Spirit gave them utterance. So this wasn't baby talk that they practiced. This was a full-fledged speaking in another language. And they, they that dwelled in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men out of every nation under heaven. Now when this was noised abroad, the multitude came together and were confounded because they heard every man speak in his own language. Now, this, is, this wording implies something that is, is a mystery. Was it the gift of tongues or the gift of hearing? I think it was both. The gift of hearing is the gift of interpretation, and the gift of tongues is the gift of speaking the language. But it says, notice it, the way it said, but that every man heard them speak in his own language. That would indicate that 50 different languages there all understood all 120 people. And the guy next to him speaking a totally different language also all understood all 120 people. In other words, the people hearing must have had the gift to understand 
what they were saying in any language. So what language were they speaking in? They could have been speaking Hebrew. And the people were all hearing that in their language, the way this reads. But uh, I don't know. I wouldn't be, it doesn't make any difference. They were all amazed and marveled, saying one to another, Behold, are not all these which speak Galileans? And how hear we every man in our own tongue? See again the wording, how hear we? We hear every man in our own tongue. Wherein we were born. Now that's, you want to know what the gift of languages is in the scriptures? That's it. It is the ability to communicate the gospel of Jesus Christ to people in a language you've never learned. Either they hear it in your language or you speaking the language. I don't know which, and it wouldn't matter as long as there's communication. It'd be equally a miraculous event. Name some of them. Parthians, Medes, Elamites, dwellers in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Potion, and goes on, names a whole bunch of them. Cretes, Arabians, so some of them were speaking Arabic. Uh, we do hear them speak in our tongues the wonderful works of God. So they understood it. It was a sign to them. They were all amazed and were in doubt, saying one to another, what meaneth this? So, you know, I'm all for that. Uh, my daughter went to Papua New Guinea to be a missionary and went to a people on top of a mountain that never had a person in there before. Never seen anybody white and nearly six foot tall. They were about four foot tall, four and a half. And they were absolutely astonished. She couldn't communicate with them. She slowly learned their language and could eventually communicate with them. How wonderful it had been if she could have just right away started speaking so that they understood. Uh, millions of missionaries would love to have that ability. Where is it today? Why isn't God doing that today? Maybe it's because we have the ability to communicate in other ways. We communicate the gospel through our good and evil to over 50 languages. And that covers most of the people in the world. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I would not have you ignorant. Notice the way he starts that. That's because the church in Corinth had fallen into ignorant use of the gift of tongues. And so in the next two, three chapters, almost four chapters, part of the 15th chapter, he is going to address this one subject, the misuse of the gift of tongues in the church. That's the theme of it all the way through. He said, I wouldn't have you ignorant. Now, here's why they might be ignorant. Corinth was a heathen city, a very corrupt city. Uh, Rome didn't have anything on the corruption that was in Corinth. Ye know that you were Gentiles carried away unto these dumb idols, even as you were led. Now, why does he identify them being Gentiles and mixed in with idolatry? Because as Gentiles, some of them spoke in tongues. As Gentiles, they would get into a trance around altars where babies were sacrificed or young women were sacrificed in some rare cases or where devils and demons were worshipped, and the priest, if not the individuals, would begin to speak in utterances that were unintelligible. And so they were carried away under these dumb idols, even as you were led. Wherefore I give you to understand that no man speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed. I, in one instance, I was not there. A friend of mine told me of a man standing up and speaking in an unintelligible utterance in a church and a, another person there who just happened to foreigner know that language told the pastor afterwards he was cursing Jesus Christ. So that was no doubt a devil situation right there. So he was speaking. He thought he was a Christian. He thought he was uh, doing everybody a favor. He was speaking in another language to him he didn't understand, but he was cursing God, Jesus Christ, in a foreign language. Now, the, there are diversities uh, of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are diversities of administrations, the same Lord. There are diversities of operations, but it's the same God who worketh all in all. 
Now, he's prepping us for this discussion of tongues, that there are differences in the gifts and difference in the way the gifts are operated and difference in the way the gifts are manifested. But they all work together for one purpose, one accord. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to every man to profit with all. So many people wrote to me and told me about how, how profitable it was to them as an individual to pray in the Spirit. Ha! There was never any indication in the Scriptures. That's why it was given. He says, it's given to every man to profit everybody with all. To profit the church, not the individual. For to one is given by the Spirit the word of wisdom, another word of knowledge, with the same Spirit. Now I have had words of knowledge. God's given me things. I've been in meeting. And God tell, has told me that there's someone there that's practicing witchcraft. Small church of uh, 125 people. Methodist church way up in Arkansas, uh, Missouri. And so I just simply said, I said, there's someone here practicing witchcraft and you're on your way to hell need to repent. A guy came up to me and said, how do you know that? I said, I don't know what. He said, about my daughter. I said, what about your daughter? He said, she's just gotten into witchcraft. I said, I didn't know. God told me. And so there are words of knowledge by the same spirit to another faith by the same spirit to another gifts of healing by the same spirit. I have prayed for people who've been healed. One child had cerebral palsy and, uh, instantly healed. Now, I was not the only one praying, and others were praying too. So I uh, certainly believe in divine healing, but I've been to the doctor a lot of times. I've been operated on several times. I've had antibiotics. I've sent my kids to get be treated. We prayed. Sometimes we've been healed. Most of the time we're not. And uh, and it's that way with everybody. You, these preachers that preach divine healing, they end up, their wife died. They, they get sick. Their kids get cancer. They go to the hospital. They die slowly. Uh, God does heal, but it's not something that we have this carte blanche ability to do at any time. Uh, to another faith by the same spirit, to another gifts of healing by the same spirit. Notice gifts of healings, each gift, each healing is a gift. There's not one gift of healing that an individual has. To another working of miracles, and uh, I've seen that too, working of miracles. To another prophecy to another discerning of spirits. Now, I've, I've exercised that gift. My wife exercised that gift in a very powerful way. Uh, to discern the presence of evil spirits or, or the righteous presence of God. I've, I've used to travel as an evangelist, go into community, and I have discern the presence of the spirits of darkness or sometimes go into a town and just be the spirit of God, just be all over the place before I got there. To another diverse gifts of tongues. Divers, different kinds, not one kind, not a heavenly language, but divers, multiple languages, to another the interpretation of tongues. Now, the interpretation of tongues is the ability to interpret another language. That means that you could go into um, Pakistan and you would understand what they're saying. God's given you the gift of interpretation. But all these worketh that one and the self same spirit dividing, dividing to every man. In other words, one man gets one gift, another man gets another gift, another man gets another gift, another gift. Severally, as he will, to sever is to separate. So God separates the gifts, gives one man the gift of healing, one man the gift of prophecy, one man word of knowledge, one man gift of tongues. He doesn't give everybody the same gift. So here's answering the argument that every believer is supposed to have the gift of languages. For as the body is one, hath many members, and all the members of that one body being many are one body, so also is Christ. For one spirit are all baptized into one body, whether it be Jew or Gentile, bond or free, whether it be we've all been made to drink into one spirit. So all people, one spirit. For the body is not one member, but many. If the foot shall say, because I'm not the hand, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If somebody says you don't speak in tongues, therefore you're not of the body, or you're not of the body? That's the point he's making. If someone says you don't have the gift of the Holy Ghost with the evidence of, then you're not part of the body. He said, that's false. He divides it severally as he will to one, one gift, to another, another. And if the ear shall say, because I'm not the eye, I'm not of the body, is it therefore not of the body? If the whole body were eye, where were they hearing? If, can you imagine one big 210-pound uh, uh, eyeball? And the eyeball says, you're an ear, so you don't belong to the body. Um Better illustration, can you imagine a 210-pound tongue uh, saying, okay, you're not of the body because you don't have this gift. But now God has set the members, every one of them in the body, as it hath pleased him. You can't go out and 
get a gift that it's not his will for you to have? If they were all one member, wherefore were the body? But now are they many members, di different members, same body, but one body? And the eye cannot say unto the hand, I have no need of thee, and again, and so forth, so forth. Now are ye the body of Christ and members in particular. And God has set some in the church. Notice the order here. First, that is a word that expresses the order of eminence. Apostles are above all the other gifts. Some po First apostles, secondarily prophets, secondarily in order of importance. Thirdly, teachers. After that, so after these three things, which all are ministries of delivering the words of God to the people. After that, miracles. So miracles is a far less gift than teaching the Bible. Gifts of healings, gift plural again, helps. Help is above other gifts. Governments, that's being able to rule in the church. Diversities of tongues, that's the last of the nine. That's the least, the diversity of tongues. Note the diversities. That means more than just one, but multiple languages, diversities of tongues. Are all apostles? What's the implied answer according to this? Oh, no, of course not. Are all prophets? Oh, no way. Can't all be prophets. Are all teachers? Mm -hmm. No. Are all workers of miracles? We know from the church that's not so. Have all the gifts of healing? No, no, they don't, special ones. Do all speak with tongues? Of course not. <laughs> well, now, wait a minute. If you belong to some of these charismatic churches, they tell you you should. So when you really don't have the gift, what do they do? They tell you to speak baby words until it starts sounding like a real language, or they get you in a hypnotic state and a highly emotional with a beat of the drums, beat of the music, you know, and you repeat over and over again. And finally, in this hypnotic state, you begin to do what people in tribal situations do. You begin to utter an incoherent a bunch of sounds that are not a language at all. Do I have the gifts of healing? Do I all speak with tongues? Do I all interpret? No. But covet earnestly the best gifts. Now, best indicate some are better than the others. And he gave us the list. So if you want to covet the best gifts, then the first one you need to desire to have is uh, apostles. And then prophets. And then teachers. And then miracles. And gifts of healings. And helps. And governments above tongues. And then finally, diversities of tongues. Now, here's a passage that some of you have thrown at me. And I love it when you do that because that means that you believe the Bible and it's your final authority. It's just that you've been misled in your understanding of it by your personal experience or the experience of others. Basically, it's emotions that give you your perspective. Though I speak with the tongues of men and of angels. This is the only place where the concept of speaking the language of angels appears in the Bible. It's the only place. And I'm going to show you that's a fallacious argument to do that. Though I speak with the tongues of men and angels and have not charity, I'm become a sounding brass or tinkling symbol. Now this is hypothetical. Though I speak, he didn't say he did. He said, if I did, though I have the gift of prophecy and understand all mysteries. Did Paul understand all mysteries? He said he didn't. Some things were a mystery to him. All mystery, that's hyperbole. Uh, and all knowledge. Paul have all knowledge? No. He pursued it, he said. And though I have all faith, did he have all faith? No, he didn't. You remember when he left? I think it was Miletus, sick, uh, and he couldn't heal him, had to leave him behind his servant. And Timothy was sick, he couldn't heal him, and he told him to take a little wine for his stomach's sake. Uh, and Paul had his eye trouble, and he prayed to God to heal it, take it away, and three times it never happened. So he didn't have all faith. So that I could remove mountains. Now, have you ever heard or known of anybody that moved a mountain with their faith, other than R.J. Letourneau with a lot of equipment? No, you've never had anybody. Why? Because all this is an exaggeration. It's, it's just He's just conceiving of the most... <laughs> the highest, most ridiculous, all-encompassing, 
Though I speak with the tongue of men and of angels. Paul is not saying he ever did, nor anyone ever has. He said, if you could. And if you could understand all mysteries, if you had all knowledge, if you had all faith, if you could remove mountains, if you did all of that, as grand and glorious, as magnificent as that would be, and have not charity, I'm nothing. And though I bestow all my goods to feed the poor and give my body to be burned, have not charity, I'm nothing. And he goes on, he talks about charity then and how it works. And then finally, uh, this chapter here, follow after charity and desire spiritual gifts, but rather that you may prophesy. He said, that's what you need to, to seek after. Now, prophesying is more than just you uh, getting a revelation of a, um, uh, something original that's going to happen that no one knows about. And you're revealing. Now, my wife has the gift of prophecy. And it's frequently exercised, and she has amazingly predicted the future. Now, it's she doesn't do it publicly; doesn't do it in the church. She didn't, I don't go to the church and tell the church what she just her latest revelation. Uh, it's for prayer. It's for prayer, and so she prays, and I pray, and uh, sometimes we see uh, God uh, change things or or see it fulfilled, and we're ready and we're prepared for it when it happens. Or sometimes we warn other people about what's going to take place in their life. Sometimes they repent. Sometimes they don't. Uh, he says, uh, follow a uh, desire spirit. Rather you may prophesy for he that speaketh in an unknown tongue speaketh not unto men. Now notice the word unknown. Anytime the word unknown appears in the King James Bible, it's in italics. Now, not in your moderns, but the King James Bible is the only one that's honest. When it inserts a word that's not in the original text, it puts it in an italics. No other one does that. So your King James Bible is the most up-to-date, advanced in translation that you could possibly get. Uh, Speaketh not unto men, but unto God. For no man understandeth him, howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. Now, by, by mysteries, he means it's just no one knows what it is. It's a secret. If you're speaking in a tongue and no in a church, which they were doing with no interpretation, no one there to interpret it, no one there that understood that language. They were just talking. Uh, he said, if you're doing that, then the only person can hear you is God. Nobody else can interpret it. And God's, God hears it. And if it's, if it's a true language, he understands what you're saying. But it's a mystery to everybody else. But he that prophesies speaketh unto men to edification, exhortation, and comfort. So that's why prophecy is better. is because you can just talk to the people that are there. He that speaketh an unknown tongue, again the word unknown, should be in italics. When I translate it from my Bible program to here, it loses its italics. Speaketh an unknown tongue, edifieth himself. Now that's, he's speaking of that deridingly. He's not recommending it. If you, if you were open-minded, you'd see that. He that speaketh an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. I mean, how degrading for you to seek your own edification. How selfish for you to seek your own edification. Much of this modern spiritualist activity in the church is spiritual masturbation. A lot of this praise, so-called praise going on, is similar to what they do in country music events or rock concerts where they go to get this emotional high, I stimulate their emotions with the beat of the music, with the excitement, with the, all the lights, all the people. And it's all there to stir you up emotionally and create dancing, vibrating spirit. And it's not of God. It's nothing more than natural human celebration of all that is human. He that speaketh an unknown tongue edifieth himself, but he that prophesieth edifieth the church. There's nowhere in the Bible that you're supposed to edify yourself. I would that you all spake with tongues, with languages. He said, that. I'd love it if you all spoke with multiple languages, but rather that you prophesied. For greater is he that prophesied than he that speaketh with languages, tongues, except he interpret. Now, if there is an interpretation of that which is spoken so that everybody understands it, then it's equal to prophesying. 
that the church may receive edifying. That's the purpose of it, to edify the church. Now, brethren, if I come unto you speaking with languages, what shall I profit you except I shall speak to you either by revelation or by knowledge or by prophesying or by doctrine? He said, it's no good to you unless I can reveal some truth you don't know about, unless I can give you some knowledge you don't have, unless I can prophesy of things to come, or I can give you a Bible doctrine. He said, that's how it would profit you. And even things without life giving sound, whether pipe or harp, except they give a distinction in the sound, how shall it be known what is piped? This modern fake tongues has no distinction in the sound. For if the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall pre prepare himself to battle? So likewise, you accept, you utter, utter by the tongue words easy to be understood. How shall it be known what is spoken? For you speak into the air. <laughs> some, uh, some woman sent us a... Uh, uh, a, a short video in response to what I this what I put out last time, a short video of 700 women, I think it was 700, all in a congregation together, speaking into the air, speaking fake tongues into the air. And uh, she titled it, I have no greater joy than to hear 700 women speaking in tongues. Well, I, there's a lot of things I'd enjoy a lot more than 700 women speaking into the air. Uh, he said, there are many, uh, there are, it may be, so many kinds of voices in the world, languages, and none of them is without signification. In other words, they're assigned to a meaning, they're a word, they mean something. So all the languages have meaning. Therefore, if I know not the meaning of the voice, I shall be unto them that speaketh a barbarian, he that speaketh shall be a barbarian unto me. So he said, if I don't understand what someone is saying when they speak in a jabber, another language, uh, then they're barbarian to me. Even so ye, for as much as you're zealous of spiritual gifts, the church in Corinth was, seek that ye may excel to the edifying of the church. Today, people, have, they know it doesn't edify the church. So they, they edify themselves, they think. You, it's not bringing you closer to Jesus. It's just giving you an experience, uh, a high, an endorphin rush. Therefore, let him that speaketh an unknown tongue, unknown language, pray that he may interpret. So if you happen to have a real gift of speaking in another language, don't come to our church jabbering it unless there's someone there that speaks it. And don't come to our church jabbering it unless you know that there's someone there who has the ability to interpret your language either by natural or divine means. But if I pray in unknown tongue, my spirit prayeth, but my understanding is unfruitful. Now, again, he's not recommending that you pray in your spirit. He is dismissing the whole concept of this personal edification by pointing to the fact that it's a personal consumption that is without merit, that the purpose is to edify the church. What is it then? I will pray with my spirit. I will pray with my understanding also. I will sing with the spirit. I will sing with the understanding. Now, he's singing with the spirit, not in a foreign language. He's singing in his own language. He's praying in his own language. Else when thou shalt bless with the spirit, how shall he that occupieth the room of the unlearned say, Amen at the giving of thanks, seeing that he understandeth not what thou sayest? For thou verily givest thanks well, but the other is not edified. I thank my God I speak with languages more than you all. And Paul did. Paul had gone to missionary to multiple languages. How did he communicate with those people? I mean, just walk into a town, he starts preaching. And uh, how did he learn 40, 50 different languages? Well, either God gave Paul the gift of speaking in the language of the Ephesians, uh, the language of Thyatira, or wherever he went, uh, went to Rome, and speak Greek. Either God gave him the ability to speak that, or he had learned those languages. So he said, I speak with uh, these languages more than ye all. Yet in the church, I'd rather speak five words with my understanding that by my voice I might teach others also. Notice the purpose is to teach others than 10,000 words in a language that I don't know, an unknown tongue. Brethren, be not children in understanding, 
How be it in malice? You remember how he started that? Be ye children, but understanding be men. So why have I raised this issue? Because so many Christians are children in regard to this. They say, I speak, start off with baby words. That's what children do. Be, be men. Grow up. I know a lot of Christians who started off in a charismatic movement. A lot of people wrote us like that and then put it away. When I became a man, I put away childish things. And they realized it was empty. It was vain. They didn't know exactly why, but they just knew that it didn't help them before God. And they just stopped all that stuff. And uh, they uh, came to understand the gospel of justification and sanctification. Some of them got saved. Some of them are already saved. And uh, began to grow in Christ after they gave up this stuff. Not like the guy back there says he has night terrors. Well, I've never in my life had a night terror. Um, and if you have the Spirit of God, the perfect love cast out fear. I don't know why you have to wake up and jabber in a foreign or an unknown or a made up language in order to get rid of your night terrors. With men of other tongues and other lips will I speak unto this people, yet for all that they will not hear me, saith the Lord. So he's using this as a rebuke to the church at Corinth. Wherefore tongues are for a sign, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not, but prophesying service. So he tells them to prophesy rather than speak with tongues. And he said, if any, if all prophesy and there come in one that believeth not, or one unlearned, he is convinced of all, he is judged of all. Thus the secret of his heart made manifest, and falling down on his face, he'll worship God, report God's in you truth. How is then, brethren, when you come together, every one of you hath a psalm, hath a hymn, hath a doctrine, hath a tongue, hath a revelation, hath an interpretation, that all things be done unto edifying. So it's edifying the church. He said, when you come together, one person has one gift, another person has another gift. And you and use it to edify. If any man speak in an unknown tongue, let it be by two or at the most by three. In other words, there should never be a gathering of the saints where more than three people speak in a, an unknown tongue. But then only if one of them interprets. One of them must interpret what the others have said. Otherwise, wherefore, if there be no interpreter, let him keep silence in the church. Let him speak to himself and to God. He's not recommending that. He is speaking deridingly of that. Just keep it quiet. Speak to yourself and to God. In other words, no noise comes out of your mouth. The person sitting next to you, don't hear him. They don't hear anything. No, no, no words are coming out of your mouth. Let him keep silent in the church. Let the prophets speak two or three. Let the others judge. If any man, be, if anything be revealed, another sitteth. Let the first hold his peace. You may all prophesy one by one, may all learn, all be confident. The spirits of the prophets are subject to the prophets. Somebody said one time, I just can't help it. The spirit comes on me and I'm moved. If it's the spirit of God, you can't help it. He said the spirit is subject to you, the spirits of the prophets. Now here's one that is, <laughs> some people want to people take part of the scripture, but not all of it. Let your women keep silence in the churches. For it's not permitted unto them to speak. No woman should ever speak in tongues in a church or a gathering of believers. Never, ever, according to the scriptures. How can you take part of the scripture and ignore something like that? For it's not permitted unto them to speak, but they're commanded to be under obedience, as also saith the law. You know, if if the tongues movement stopped among women there wouldn't be any tongues movement it's basically a female movement men that get caught of it are driven by female emotions i can see that hit pretty hard didn't it and if they will learn anything let them ask their husbands at home for it's a shame for a woman to speak in the church a woman is not to preach not to prophesy not to speak in tongues in the church if you don't like it, take it up with Paul. You say, well, I, the Spirit told me. Yeah, here's what he says. What, came the word of God out from you or came it unto you only? If any man think himself to be a prophet or spiritual, let him acknowledge the things that I write unto you or the commandments of the Lord. So you say, well, I, I, you know, the Spirit's led me. He said, if you think you're spiritual, then you need to obey what God said because that's God's commandment. Whatever you say doesn't matter. That's God's commandment. If any man be ignorant, let him be ignorant. So mostly during my life, I've just let people be ignorant on this subject. But I, I've recently I've had a couple good friends that I taught 
the Bible, but never talked on this subject. You didn't mention it. It wasn't in that necessity. I mean, when I taught Corinthians, I did, but that's it. And they went off and got involved in this. And when they did, it killed the ministry. It killed their ministry. They're both, one of them was headed to a mission field, not anymore. Now his whole pleasure is trying to get other people to speak in tongues. And uh, they both just kind of stagnated over it. And so I don't want to lose any more well-taught, godly, evangelistic people to this silly, effeminate, ridiculous movement. Uh, I am going to stop there. There's a lot more could be said, but uh, we've said enough, <laughs> and I'm tired of talking about it. I'm going to go back out and pick a big head of lettuce and some broccoli and cauliflower and uh, asparagus. I got the prettiest asparagus you ever saw and fix myself a good dinner. All right. That's all for this time. That's why I'm 76. And the 50-year-olds have to run to stay up with me. <laughs>